the workers will go to do tree trimming. And on the same line that they are working, they're finding contractors on the same line. So T and Tech is paying twice to, to do tree trimming on one line. The OWTU vice president says productivity at T and Tech seems to be driven by the whims and fancies of middlemen and contractors. And this is one of the main reasons why T and Tech remains in a lost position. The figure of $100 million, the union questions that. We feel that is far more. Because in T and Tech's accounts, there's no line item, no line item, which specifically identifies how much contractor labor costs. It has been hidden. Berg acknowledges that overtime accounts for a fair percentage of T and Tech's expenditure, but he emphasizes that workers cannot give themselves overtime. Overtime has to be issued and approved by management. So the fact that our overtime rates could be as high as 30% means that our management is allowing a lot of non-productive overtime for whatever purpose. Berg says although TN Tech wanted to send home 200 workers last year, the commission is actually severely lacking field workers. He claims the commission is attempting to make workers do work outside of their job description by fulfilling two roles. Our safety rules determine that the foreman should be free to observe and direct. So if you have a two-man crew, the foreman will have to assist in the work and he cannot ensure that the work goes ahead safely. And if you think that we are just being difficult, in an 11-month period between September 2011 and August 2012, five people died on the Tech system. Renessa Cutting, TV6 News. Well, following the, the revelation by TN Tech last week that it pays roughly 120 million overtime every year, the OWT, of course, is firing back and they're here. They want to talk about um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the management at TN Tech. And Comrade Burke is here to explain some of these issues, sir. Welcome to Morning Edition. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, you, you said that um, five workers had died on the TN Tech system in an 11 month period. Has that environment of health and safety, has that environment been improved since? Well, certainly we haven't had the level of fatalities. We have had fatalities since then, mm -hmm. but it wasn't at that alarming, alarming rate. Yes. Now, the, the, the thing about it, there's a, there's a science to calculating how many um, unsafe acts leads to death. Um, we, the, the Heinrich principle says for every 300,000 unsafe acts, there's one fatality. Now, t and Tech is a relatively, rel relatively small company by world standards. And uh, the 2,500, 3,000 workers that we are responsible for could not produce those 300,000 unsafe acts statistically. So it means that there's a, a parallel workforce out there that would be doing um, these unsafe acts. And it's very instructive to know, out of the five fatalities um, during that 11 month period, three were contractors. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the principle, the hiring principle would, would suggest that the contractors are doing a lot of unsafe work out there. I, I want you to help the public to understand something fundamental to the, to the, to the structure of TN Tech. Why is there a need for contract workers? Well, the, our collective agreement caters for contracting, mm -hmm. not in the work, not, not for the work normally done by the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so you find like civil engineering um, works, construction of buildings and so on. Mm -hmm. These are things that are not part of our core function. Right. And you will expect that if you have to do that work, then you will um, engage contracting. So that is not a problem. The problem is, the work that is normally done by the regular workforce. Yes. And what has been happening over the last 20 years or so is that there has been increased increase, um, contracting out of work normally done by the regular workforce. So you're looking at um, meet connections, disconnections, um, line construction, street lighting, and so on. In, 19, in 2005, the then government asked the union to allow them to do 
looked uh, like the highways, and that was the birth of the street lighting implementation unit. It was supposed to be for two years. Um, TN Tech then incorporated the SLIU and maintained a high level of contracting out and temporary workers. Mm -hmm. um, I we have proven that that has not been prof profitable or beneficial because of the high level of exploitation of, work, of workers and, of course, the high level of contracting out of work. Um, and that, that we have been able to slowly eradicate that from the system. But the culture, the negative culture that that inculcated in the commission is, is something that is, is a lot the more difficult to eradicate. So what you're saying is that after that, after that um, initiative of establishing the, the street lighting unit and um, uh, installing that infrastructure, that these workers were in fact kept on the job. Yes. So what are these, these contract workers that were originally attached to the street lighting unit? Mm -hmm. They are now performing core functions within the TNTEC org structure. Okay, some of them are now permanent, mm -hmm. right? But the real problem, uh, uh, there's a high level of contractor um, engagement. Mm -hmm. So you had temporary workers in the employ of TNTEC, and then you had contractors operating, doing parallel work. Right. That's where the problem is. And you see, this is where, this is where the public will be confused. Mm. If you have contract workers augmenting the permanent workers of TNTEC, why then this 120 million bill for overtime? Now, we have complained to the present and past board about the high level of non-productive overtime being issued by the management. Mm -hmm. That nothing has been done, especially by the current board, to deal with that. Right? We have written to, to the board, to the chairman of the board, who incidentally is in charge of the HR subcommittee of the board. Mm -hmm. So you would think that you would we'd have gotten some action by now. We have presented the, those concerns since January last year. The expert in writing, we presented a comprehensive report on contracting and so on. We presented that um, to the chairman since March the 3rd last year. Yes. And to date, he hasn't done anything. But to alleviate these, these, these issues. And these issues impact very, very seriously on production and efficiency. And, but you know, Mr. Burke, and I know you're saying this deliberately, you're saying non-productive overtime. You're saying that because you, in your view, the, the overtime that is being issued here really doesn't add any value to the organization. It, it does not. It does not. And it, it, it sometimes you feel that the commission is using over time for means other than why it should be used. And, and that is disturbing to you. You're know. saying something, but you're not saying something. <laughs> you're saying something, but you're not saying something. But again, it is, it is, it is instructive to note that this overtime has to be approved by management. Has to be. Uh, you, you see, I, I have served an, in another place. And you sit down at, at, at the highest level and you hear managers Talk about overtime like if it's the worker's fault. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a worker. I work overtime. Mm -hmm. You are told by your manager, listen, we need to work overtime so on, on so on so place. Right. You work the overtime and you claim your hours and they approve it. Right. So if, if, if a worker decides to go and do something outside working hours and it's not uh, approved by the manager, he will not get paid. Correct. So this whole thing about blaming workers for overtime is a myth. It's an excuse for to, to, to show up management's own inefficiency. And, and, and we are saying at TN Tech, the real big ticket item is generation, the cost of generation, and gas. And that has nothing to do with the ordinary worker. Mm -hmm. That is TN Tech policy. That is government policy. Yes. The, 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 the other challenge that, the other challenge that I, I suppose the, the, the entity has to, has to address, of course, um, apart from the, the price of gas that they'll have to pay and so on, but it is rumored that the entity will be seeking a tariff increase very soon? Well, the way the thing is supposed to work is that the RIC should be monitoring the index operations all the time. Right. So that when there's a time, when, when, the, when the utility applies for a rate increase, there shouldn't be any the protracted deliberation. Because you have the monitoring the operations, you should be able to predict what um, increases or if any at all is required. Yes. Right? Now, the, the, when, when you have an RIC with board members appointed by the state, it is not independent, that's a, that's a myth. <laughs> and you have an important utility also owned by the state. Sometimes the state 
prevents the both entities from doing their work and their interests. So the law says, the TN Tech Act says that they, you need the operator to generate enough surplus to meet your operating expenses and plus finance your, your capital development and so on. Correct. That's the law. Mm -hmm. Anytime TN Tech operates, other than that, it's operation outside the TN Tech Act. Mm -hmm. The RIC has the power to grant these increases, so, and, and, and they don't. It's so, it's so terrible that in 2006, TN Tech for, for, for gold and uh, a $200 million increase in rates. In 2006? In 2006. Mm -hmm. we, our electricity is so cheap that entities are making millions of dollars in profits, getting subsidized electricity, and that's not fair. It's not fair to the company. The workers are made to carry the burden. It's yes. not fair to the workers. Yes. And when the state does not have money to subsidize, to subsidize, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have an increase that is larger than is required. The government, and, and that, is, that is one of the problems I'm having with, with the TNTX management. You go to a parliament, you do not speak to power in the way they ought to be spoken to, right? Because the, the, the structural um, challenges that TNTX has, is mainly based on policy. Mm -hmm. If the state makes a proper arrangement for gas and the PPAs were not so onerous to TNTEC, the PPAs are the power purchase agreements. Yes, the take or pay type take contracts. Pay. Yes. Right? Imagine you have a, 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 a power plant that is fully owned by the state, right? Where you can integrate it with TNTEC, save on conversion costs, and have better control of how the gas is used. And you want to privatize that. So all that's happening is that TNTEC is losing large sums of money, but these power purchase are, um, supply, um, power, these bulk suppliers. They're very profitable. They're very profitable. Yes. So TNTEC is subsidizing, and in two cases, these power, power purchase, these are bulk suppliers are either partially or, or totally owned by multinationals. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing, we're enriching people who are rich already and trying to get all people to sacrifice. And this is, a, this, is the, 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 this is what the state is doing. The government will argue that they, they receive a dividend from, from those entities and also they're, they're more comfortable with private sector entities managing the power generation aspect of electricity uh, distribution. That's an old argument. And, 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 and in my experience, that's an argument to what uh, governments in the third world by the IMF and the World Bank, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's, it's the economic hitman. Uh, right, that's <laughs> correct, all over again. <laughs> what is happening at TNTEC is a means of taking repatriating profits to enrich multinationals in the case of the bulk suppliers. And in terms of the local contractors, transferring state funds into private pockets. Are you, are you convinced that TNTEC as an entity, I mean, this, this debate um, started since, since the 80s and into the 90s with the creation of power gen and so on. Are you confident that TNTEC as an entity can manage its own power generation? I mean, given the challenges with just managing the distribution of electricity, do, do you think TNTEC can also effectively manage their power generation? Well, the OWTU as an organization has always fought for locals to determine our own destiny. Right? Sometimes these locals disappoint you immensely. Um, in, in, within the state enterprise sector, and TNTEC is no exception, there is a lack of economic patriotism to the state enterprise which these guys manage. Mm -hmm. And we have told them so. Mm -hmm. uh, but the short answer to your question is yes. Once we, d we do not allow um, managers to outsource their right to manage to contractors and middlemen. Of course they can. And you know, if things don't make sense, right, you follow the dollars. The, the, the state has a responsibility to ensure that contracting is controlled. Boards of state enterprises, and TNTEC is no exception, must not allow managers of these state enterprises to break the law or, this on, or not to honor collective agreements and, and so on. Yes. Unfortunately, that is happening. And the state stands idly by, the board stands idly by, and these, these managers just abuse their, their responsibilities. But the public of Trinidad and Tobago, effectively, they're staring down the barrel of higher electricity prices. If we, if we look at the structural issues, 
NGC is paying more for gas. That will be passed on to TNTech in terms of the in terms of the, the, the arrangements between NGC and, mm -hmm. and, and um, the power generating plants. You, you're faced with, it, with the challenge. You're also faced with the challenge of TNTech requiring additional funds for its maintenance, its capital development program. Um, this issue of overtime and, and treating with this overtime and so on, these operational inefficiencies, as you so correctly put, put them, non-productive overtime, with all of these matters on the table impacting the organization, Metal Steel is no longer at Point Leases. That's a, a loss of an important customer. Mm -hmm. It therefore means that TNTech's revenue base was eroded significantly when they departed. Well, that is a very, very interesting observation. You don't hear TNTech balling for Metal's, for Metal's departure. And the, why? Metal had been operating with rates that are subsidized. Metal had been putting TNTech under tremendous pressure. Their departure, sad as it is, we lost foreign exchange, we lost taxes, and most importantly, we, the loss of jobs. Loss of jobs. Right? And downstream activity, because yes. Metal is a primary producer, put a lot of people in a lot of problems. But in terms of TNTech, it eased the burden, because the, sub, the high level of subsidized power that Metal was consuming is no longer the case. So you don't find TNTech bawling about Metal's departure, right? It, Metal was our largest customer by a long way. And because the, and, and to give the general manager credit for one thing, mm -hmm. he tried to get Metal to pay the correct rates. That is part of the reason why they left. Right. So we, we, the government's policy is to attract direct foreign investment, but when the investors come, they feel subsidized investors are right and they don't want to pay their fair way. And that attitude is not only with, 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 with foreign multinationals. It also exists within the local community. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that we get economic rates, as particularly from those who are making money off of cheap electricity. In effect, Metal was benefiting from a sort of a hidden subsidy. It's even worse than that. Metal, on the backs of cheap electricity from TNTech and sacrificed by TNTech workers, became moved from a backwater turbo steel producer to the largest steel producer every, ca every category in the world. It's, that was financed by the, the plant at Point Lisas. People don't know that. They don't care to know. Because if you simplify the argument for them and say, is the workers to blame, that's all, work that's all the population wants to hear. They're not, they're not interested in hearing, and, and that's why the OWT was is trying to educate the, the population. About, about the poor policies that, that impact on a lot of these state, ent state enterprises, of which the Antec is one of the key ones. You know, um, Mr. Burke, one of the things, one of the things that, um, that will be put forward in, uh, you know, in this kind of argument is the fact that these subsidies, this, this so-called enabling environment for multinationals is so critical to attract foreign direct investment. Is that argument still an old argument or is that still a current argument? No, I mean, no, no, no um, responsible commentator would, would say that we shouldn't attract um, foreign investment, right? However, in attracting foreign investment, you can't give a leash up. And there are investors that you could encourage and investors you should stay far away from. If, if somebody wants to pay the same rates that they paid in 1990, in 2015, is that the kind of investor you want? Right? Some investors, foreign investors, engage in transfer pricing, which simply is you sell your product at less than, than, than cost to a subsidiary in the next country mm -hmm. and only pay taxes on, on 50%. Let's say it's 50%. On, on the lower revenue. On the lower rate. And yeah. then sell it at market price from, your, from a subsidiary overseas. Now, once the government knows that, they, they, they should be taking action to prevent these kind of investors from so doing. The legislative framework is weak, the will, political will is weak, and, and the population is not aware of these things. Now, the Minister of Finance did raise the issue of transfer pricing. He's been talking about it a lot recently, the Minister of Energy as well. I don't know to what extent they have considered the legislative framework to really um, deal with that issue, but here's, here's the critical thing. The critical thing is, if TNTech is to be an organization that is self-sustaining, the bottom line is TNTech will have to raise its tariffs. Is that a correct conclusion to this? 
the Tiontech will have to operate within the law, which means that they must operate with a surplus enough to meet their expenses, right? And their capital development. And the capital development. Now, what has been happening, the state has been um, given transfers for some capital development, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you increase your, your, your capital, you end up with more recurrent costs because you have more plant to maintain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that puts pressure on your, on your rates, right? There are other costs associated with, with operating, materials, salaries, etc. Yes. Right? Now, we just concluded a very, very significant um, in, um, increase on job evaluation at the same time. Yes. Because the commission has been delaying settling these negotiations, it, it all bunched up. Right? So, so all these things are part of the operating costs. And therefore, if you, if, if you don't increase your rates, right, to something that's fair and reasonable, then when the government doesn't have funds, you're going to find yourself in a bind, and that's what's happening now. Accumulating debt. Right. If it's not necessary to subsidize our entity, and the, and the population could absorb the costs, it is put on to do it. You see? Well, you know, the, the, the challenge here, he Mr. Will. Burke, the challenge here is that all of this will impact the society going forward. Oh. And I tell you this, um, you see, after the carnival period, I think it's important that you come back mm -hmm. and bring this message so that people could understand the reality of teen tech. Hopefully, we can get uh, some of the managers to come in as well and have this conversation because this is going to impact everyone's bottom line. You know, when, what, what people have to recall, let's take fuel, fuel prices. And that is going to get worse. But right? we got to go. we right. got to go. We got to go, Mr. Burke. I want to thank you for being here. Um, this is an important conversation. The whole question of the use of uh, contractors and the whole question of the overtime as well, um, T and Tech's revenue structure. We're going to have to talk about it a little more. Well, we we most willing and available. Have a safe, have a safe carnival. Thanks for having me. Yes. All right, folks. We're going to run to a break. When we come back, uh, there's a lot more that we need to get into. Our carnival agenda awaits. Don't go anywhere.